So, hello. Hello. How's it going, Matt? Good. Did you have a good Father's Day? I did. I ate a lot of food. I drank a lot of beer. I went and saw this comedy folk singer guy that was actually very humorous. Um, uh, outside, uh, we have my town is right on Lake Michigan, Lake, Mich- Lake Michigan, and there's uh, different pubs and bars that are sort of like right on the lake. And uh, one of them had this this live band that was playing it was it was it was very entertaining. It was fun. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, it was good. We uh we went to there's a there's a science center here in Portland that I've been meaning to go to ever since we moved here. I just never I don't know, for four years never never no just never did it. Um called OMSI. Uh it turns out it's a little more kids focused than I expected. Uh growing up in the Midwest we have like COSI out there, like in Ohio, you probably have something near you like that. I think COSI is like all over the eastern half of the United States by now, so I think I'm not sure about that. What is but, it called? Cosi, C O S I. Oh, Cos. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I believe it's like a tra- almost like a tra. I think there are some permanent locations, but I think it also travels. Anyway, um, I expected it to be kind of like that, and it wasn't. It was it was a lot more kids focused. There were definitely non kids portions, but there, it was mostly a kids thing. Anyway, we stopped by the gift shop. We so we went to the observatory, uh, the planetarium, the planetarium rather, not the observatory, the planetarium. And uh, that was uh, that was interesting. Lily didn't handle it very well at the beginning, uh, but she loved it towards the end. And then we went to the gift shop, and I, I laid my eyes on this. Sweetest pie. Aww. <laughs> and, and, the... <laughs> and then you bought one for you that was adult-sized. Well, it could be. <laughs> yes, giant, yeah. That's a fact. Uh, yes. So anyway, it was a, it was a fun day, and then for my for for my gift, uh, my my wife um, finally scheduled me a return to pilots lessons because I have had this for like four years. She bought this for my birthday like four years ago. Was um, that like a flight log book? Yeah, and I don't know if you know this about me, but I actually have like eighty hours in the in the cockpit, um, but it was all when I was like sixteen or seventeen. So I more or less know what I'm doing, like conceptually. I just am obviously very way out of practice, and uh, also those hours are like beyond not good. Uh, so it doesn't really matter that I have that many hours because I'm gonna have to do everything all over again anyway. But uh, I do have the, the advantage of knowing that I like flying, so it's not really a discovery thing for me. It's more just like getting it done. Nice. Yeah, you should so, definitely. Um, you should definitely do that. That's pretty cool. That's something I've always wanted to do, and I, I'm probably not. That's probably a thing I won't do uh, on the list of all the things I could do. That, so I'm always like, really, uh, I don't know. I'm always yeah. a little bit jealous, but also like, man, you should totally go do that. That would be awesome, and take videos and share because that's got to sure. be one of the greatest feelings in the world. It is. It's a lot of fun, and 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 to be honest, like the only reason, like if I. It, if I uh, if I had to do it over again, which I am going to do, um, one of the things I'll be doing differently is getting it all done quickly. Because like the worst thing you can do is like, like you you should either do one lesson and and say like, yep, I tried it, that's good, and then call it quits, or go all the way quickly. Um, which I would obviously recommend the latter because I think getting your pilot's license is dope. But um, what you don't want to do is kind of like lackadaisically approach it over like the course of like a few months because what this what any CFI will do is like have you like redo lessons, um, and you and it's very expensive by the hour, so you should not be repeating anything. If you're going to go for it, go for it like within a few weeks and and get it done. Um, and that's not what we did when when I was a kid. We we went very intermittently. So you don't need eighty hours. You need way less than that. But because most of it was review, we had to repeat a lot of stuff. All right. We, actually, we have some viewers, so uh, we should probably start uh, start the conversation we're going to have. Yeah. Yep. I don't know how long this will go. This uh, this particular session. I don't. I don't. I don't know if it needs to go a whole hour, but I don't know. Let's let's see what happens. Let's see if people got questions in chat. Um, you know, during the conversation. But uh, welcome to the stream, everyone. This is the Entry Labs, uh, I think, episode 13 or 14 live stream. 
what was it last year? Or it's 13, isn't it? Something like that. Yeah. I think last week was like, the, I don't think we got to 13. This might be 13 actually. Okay. So we're <laughs> live stream number 13. Um, I am, uh, I am Derek Winkworth, uh, otherwise known as at cloud toad on Twitter, C L O U D T O A D. And this is my co-host, Matt Oswald, um, known as Mirden, uh, at M I E R D I N on Twitter. Uh, so, you know, please follow us there. Uh, also follow the official NRE Labs uh, Twitter account at NRE Labs. Um, so we do this stream every single week. Uh, we talk about all, all different kinds of things and, uh, you know, every week and with some humorous banter. We try to do humorous banter. Um, <laughs> we do. I, I think we're good at it, actually, to be honest. We're, we're pretty good at it. Yeah, it depends. I think for me, it depends on how long I've uh, sipping at this, I just started. So, uh, yeah, some mornings are better than others. Yeah, as my, as my co-hosts on the Tech Village podcast will attest. Like there are some days when I've when I'm past the first cup, and they're just like, okay, reel it in. <laughs> <laughs> well, you drink crazy coffee, man. Like like it made my heart race. It made me made me worry about my future. But oh, that's funny, it. actually. That's actually the meme on that on that podcast is uh, Stump Town Nitro, which is what which is what I gave you. Um, that stuff is pretty intense. It's like 250 milligrams of caffeine per can, which is a lot. <laughs> it is a lot, yeah. It's a significant amount. Um, yeah. So you haven't had coffee, which means you're going to be the weak point on this on the stream. Well, what you get to see is actually the journey because I'm like halfway through now, and so you'll get to see me evolve like a, like Pikachu, like transform. Um, yeah. <laughs> you're going to assume your final form. Um, so isn't that Dragon Ball Z or something? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not a nerd like you. Yeah. I'm not... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. So he says the guy with his Starcraft poster. <laughs> yeah. In the background there. Um, that's a great game. So what we're going to talk about today is, um, you know, I we go we we fly around a lot. We talk to a lot of different people, and uh, we and we talk about automation um, and why it's important for network engineers to at least know the basics and and um, to you know to get a, some kind of practice going where you know you're you can create tools that are relevant for the actual work you do as an engineer. And what happens is that people. It, because there's so much messaging out there and the word automation is, is thrown around so much, um, people start to conflate. Like, what is the difference between, you know, buying a tool that automates the network, if you will, yeah. and and then doing some kind of automation yourself? Like, you know, what is – why why couldn't I just buy a tool and then I would never have to learn anything about automation or Bash or what a REST API is or, or whatever? And I thought, you know, we should we should definitely have this conversation, um, and we, and you know, we we'll we'll freeform it here, and we'll see what comes of it because I think um, this could be a whole series of blogs, actually, this topic, uh, yeah. you know, given specific examples and things like that. And you know, one of the things I was thinking about when, um, you know, how how I would explain this is, you know, look at the categories that are on the NRE Labs website. We have. We have fundamentals, we have tools, and we have workflows. And I think um, our perspective on automation is uh, that, you know, those those things go together, right? There's, you have to have the fundamentals, right? You don't have to be an expert in every single thing. You don't have to be a Pythonista. You don't have to know, you know, um, the Bash uh, syntax um you know, specification, I'm sure it exists, right? Um, you don't have to know all those things in, in excruciating detail, but you should know the fundamentals and, and the basics, um, like the key ideas, you know, you know, that go into each of those things. And then you, you take those fundamentals and, and you have a given set of tools in your work, in your environment, in your production environment at work um, or in a lab environment. Um, th things like help desk tools and inventory tools and network monitoring tools of varying you know different types, um, logging tools, um, 
you know, there's, there's, you could probably make a whole list of all the different kind of tools that are out there. And uh, when you take those fundamentals and you combine them with the tools, then you can start automate, automating your workflows as an engineer. And it's that, it's that last part that's really important, your workflows as an engineer, not necessarily automating the network. Um, the network is, I was, and you can interrupt me at any time because I'm, I'm just going to rant <laughs> if you have a, have a thought. But the network is kind of already automated. We have dynamic routing protocols, um, for instance. Um, everything is dynamic, right? Like when if you, well, presumably, this, assuming there's no bugs, when you do, you know, bonded Ethernet and um, a link goes down, then it's taken out of the, you know, out of the hashing algorithm um, for for distribution of flows across the remaining links. And then when it comes back up, it's automatically added um, it, with VRRP, right? When um, the primary or master or whatever it's called goes down, the secondary will will detect that and automatic, you know, after some amount of time automatically come up. And we have all kinds of things like that, BFD, um, you, you know, um, and then of course all the route BGP and OSPF and, and all that stuff, which will automatically automatically route around failures and stuff like that. Fast reroute will do that. So a lot and of the things... important, I think the important thing to, to call out is like everybody assumes that 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 because you have a controller now you're at that next stage of things. But guess but but SDN controllers uh, have the same paradigms. They're just a little more complicated and use like new terminology, but they have the same kind of mechanisms built in. You know, like they they know to look for certain criteria on edge devices and respond accordingly, just like any other routing protocol would, like where it says, okay, I've received a message from a peer, I need to update this table. Same thing happens with an SDN controller. It's just the the difference is in its implementation. Yep. It, no matter what, it doesn't really matter from a technical perspective, those technologies are built within, this is the important thing, within their domain to do the things they need to do to work. So this isn't about filling in any sort of like technical gaps within one of those domains. Um, the question I think that people need to ask themselves are, um, okay, you know, everything, every time you interact with any network device or controller, the, the broader task at hand, does that start and end all within the controller? Like, do you get instructions from the SDN controller to make a change and then the SDN controller emails you and says, I need to make this change. And oh, by the way, you need to update this other table within the SDN controller. No, you might do like one or two tasks of that workflow within the controller or within, you know, a specific router or switch. But you're the source of that of that workflow, the thing that where you're where we're not even talking about automating the network, we're talking about your job, the things that you are required to do in your job. Most of those come from outside the network entirely. Most of them come from outside technology. It's a human thing. Or, or from other systems. And so no matter what, like the workflows that we're talking about don't just stay within any one of these technical like domains. They're always coming from outside uh, the, the, the tech, that technical domain and then probably ending outside of it as well. So like when you're talking about automating, when we're talking about doing automation, we're talking about that intercellular space where like we're not expecting people to replace the functionality of a routing protocol. That's not the point. It's always... It's not it's not intra domain, which is what I would consider like a routing protocol would do. Yeah. But like but like it's actually actually inter domain things that like outside of the bounded context of, of a product, things that no one product ever will, frankly, solve. And it's, it's our job. That's why we're engineers. We're, it's our job to solve those those problems outside of those products, which we've done for a long time. We just need to do it in a different way. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, the difference, you know. <clears throat> You know, if you imagine the, the network is a circle um, and everything attached to the network, you know, it's I guess you could say is on a, around the edges. Right. So it's and, and it, it could be an, anything. Right. And our intuition, a lot of times when we talk about stuff, um, we always say servers and whatever laptops and uh, um, tablets or phones and things that um, people actually, you know, uh, things that run actual applications that people would would recognize anywhere in the business um, and, and things that people interact with when they're when they're doing stuff on the network or on the internet but it's really it's it's everything around that right it's, there's like storage arrays and there's kubernetes clusters and uh, vmware clusters and um, there's you know firewalls and ips's and 
voice over IP systems. There's like there's there's so many things that are around the edges there, and uh, when you're any kind of workflow that you want to do, um, you know, if, in order to be complete, we'll probably start or end with one of those systems around the network. Um, and that doesn't include, you know, a whole second set of systems, which is all this sort of management domain stuff that you have to interact with. So, like I said, like log servers and, and ticketing systems and mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing, right? A network. It might not even be that sexy. It might be a CSV. Like you might, you might need to start your workflow just by learning how to parse a CSV file with Python. We talked about that at Interop with uh, Jeremy Schulman. He brought that up. We, we've been, we, we, I actually helped kickstart a little bit of a debate where we talked about, I think I mentioned this on the stream where we talked about Interop actually, where I mentioned that I, I thought the, the hello world of network automation, the, you know, that first example that we tell people about when we try to explain what network automation is and why they should care, like. It needs to it needs to change because we keep talking about network automation as if it's like just you know config management, but there's all these other things that that are probably way more applicable to ninety percent of people out there, and those things might not be super sexy like you know like we discussed it might just be learning how to parse a CSV pi a CSV file in Python because that's what you know one of your ticketing systems or your you know server systems kicks out. And you just need to be able to parse that. Like you don't want to deal with an API yet. You just need to be able to parse a CSV file. That's okay. That's fine. That 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 helps with your job. And that's all we're talking about here. Things that things that you know, learning automation to help with your operational tasks. That's kind of the the goal of all of this. Um, the problem is it's 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 hard to it's hard to say like what everyone's first step will be. So I think that the the change. In, in mentality has to be one of um, kind of like how the example I like to give in this case is like uh, when you're learning how to, you know, be a painter, for instance, do you go to a bunch of museums and like memorize how they're painted so that you can like perfectly replicate them pixel perfect? Like, no, you might go there for inspiration, certainly. Um, and you'll know, you'll know some of the really popular painters and how they paint and like you might pick up on some of their styles, but the point is never to just replicate what they've done. The point is to understand the fundamentals and, and build a repertoire of seemingly, seemingly inapplicable skills for later, basically. Like you're building this repertoire of, of fundamental skills that, that you, you, know, you, you sort of put on the back burner until you need them, but then when you need them, you have them. And, and, and I think people expect that, you know, from day one, you should be able to paint the Mona Lisa, but that's just not the case. It's, it's, I think it's very important to look at the, the, the breadth of what people are doing. Part of what we've done with NRE Labs is help, help get the word out about what people are doing. So you go there and you say, oh, cool, people are building things in this way. And you use that for inspiration, but when it comes to actually building the skills yourself, Focusing on those fundamentals is easily the best way to to ensure that you're going to have success because then you're going to be able to build your own solution, and that's that's the whole point is to own the solution that 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 you that that uh, that addresses those sort of intercellular workflows. But I think it's 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 hard for us. Like the challenge for like folks like you and I, Derek, is like it's hard to sell that. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like you can't. It's hard to. It's not. It's not only hard to like convince people to do that, but it's also um, not, it's not very bounded. It tends to be very, um, like you could talk about that kind of stuff all day and give like billions of use cases. Um, and I think that's what another thing people get hung up on is, is they get sort of drowned in the ocean of possible things you can do with automation. Yeah. And, and without some grasp of what can be automated, um, it, that tends to escalate very quickly in people's minds to, you know, these, uh, aspirations of building something like you know network skynet and um that yeah. which always fails right so and then you're it's it's really um for for me i i, I like uh, the approach that we have because it's you know oper operationally rooted right we both come from operations uh kind of backgrounds and for me it's it's more about you know doing that end-to-end -end workflow like hey i'm gonna you know i have a spreadsheet it has some things that need to change or some um information that has to be collected and then when it's done collecting i needed to have it posted the results posted um you know in slack or in a ticket or you know, in a google doc right um and and you know and then shared with everyone or whatever and that you know that's the kind of workflow that um that i have in mind when i think about network automation um not these you know uh, not these very um 
some of the things I hear are insane. Like, they're, like, yeah. If if those some of the things that um, people say could be built, they would be built um, and successful. But, um, you yeah. know, there's there's a reason why there isn't a controller that just you know completely and totally automates everything in your network. It's uh, it's lots of people have tried and failed. It's not going to happen. <laughs> At least, you know, maybe maybe it will, but I don't think any time in the next 10 years even it's going to happen. Yeah, not with the way the industry currently is, no. I mean, there's still so much operational knowledge being, um, yeah, it's just, it, it, it's, it's even, even if it, even in single vendor environments, which you would think that that would be the one place where it might be possible, but nah, it, it, it hasn't worked out that way. Yeah, I... <clears throat> So let, let's talk a little bit about some examples, right? Like one of the my my uh, if I had to think about what I actually spent most of my time doing when I was running uh, production networks, or I worked in managed services for a long time. Um, when I was when I was doing work in those shops, what was I as a network engineer like? If I were to time myself and then categorize my activities, you know, configuring configuration was actually. Um, was a tiny sliver of my time like you just said it was like maybe it was during a change window right um sometimes you know i whatever you update a banner or you you know a login banner or something like that um interface descriptions you know things like that you could you, but even even when you add that outside of that change window we're talking about you know very very little amount of time you spend actually in the act of configuring and even leading up to that configuration change and then after the configuration change it, you you collect information right and you put it together yeah. and you format it so that it, you can status on it or you can you know surmise you know the state of the network um you know in a way that captures whether or not that change was successful and so when i wasn't collecting information um for the purpose of making changes I was collecting information for the purpose of finding issues, for for understanding what's going on in the network, for for all different kinds of reasons when um, that comes up, and and so I guess where I'm going with this is that I most of the time I spent as a network engineer was actually collecting and correlating information, um, yeah. so that I could have a some clear mental model of what is going on with the network or what needs yeah. to happen with the network. Well, also, also, this is this is also kind of humorous because you and I both have some of the hyperscale, like network operations people, uh, like Google, Facebook kind of folks like that, and uh, the that percentage is not different there. Like everybody assumes that because it's Google and Facebook that they just all they change their network all the time, um, and because their networks are like massive, like sure, the number of changes that they have if you're bounding it by like, you know, t you know, changes per week, like it's going to be harder than like, if you have two switches, obviously, but that percentage is not different. Like, in fact, in, in many ways, that percentage is even lower because they, they try to keep the underlay as simple as possible. Um, so don't, you know, don't get wrapped up on this, like, well, you know, uh, because of my scale, I don't, I don't make a lot of changes. It's like hyperscalers don't change a lot either. They, they're, they're pretty simple and, and they, they, they try to make things as cookie cutter as possible. When they do make changes, it's for like basic policy stuff. It's not like, ah, oh, I'm going to change like all of my switches now like this. Yeah, that's, it's just not, it's not a realistic thing to expect. I think it's funny. I, I, most of the folks that are listening probably kind of implicitly already know this. And in, in fact, most of the people that need to learn this lesson probably are like on the vendor side because they have these, this, this, uh, this idea that their customers do nothing but configure things all day. And I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. And that's that's a true statement. Like they when they imagine what the user does with this product, they they imagine they're just furiously adding routes and VLANs and like <laughs> all that stuff, right? They're just they're constantly yeah. adding, you know, to the config or removing from the config and, and changing the way the network behaves. And that's actually that's that's a like it's a tiny percentage of the time. So let's 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 simplify this then. If like if you just think of the stud, forget about the network for a second. Just think of like the things you have to do during the day. Whatever it is, doesn't matter what it is, doesn't even matter if it's going to the bathroom, just for the sake of conceptualizing this. Yeah. Like just talk just think about the things that you as a as a as a network engineer do in the course of a week. And then and then consider could automation help me with whatever that task is. Doesn't matter what it is. 
could automation help me with that task? The answer is almost almost always yes. Uh, the the question then becomes, is it worth it? Like, is it going to save me some time or whatever? What what is the value of that? Which that's going to vary wildly based on the task. But the question that you start with is very important because you're not you're not framing it as, oh, I need to automate the network or I'll be out of a job or or that's just the thing to do. Like that's not it's a that's that's a false premise. You're starting off on the wrong foot. However, if you start off on the foot of, you know, I have the current way of doing things, could automation augment that operational model, the things that I actually require to do day to day, the answer is almost always yes, and then you just have to go figure out how to do it and how to apply it to yourself, which then I think goes back to learning the fundamentals, because you'll have to make that sort of application, um, you know, yourself, like you have to map those fundamental skills to the things you do during the day. But I think it's important to stop, start off on that foot. People always get wrapped around the, the idea that automation is all about just like controlling their switches and routers or like, or like the hello world that we, that we keep either explicitly but often implicitly telling people, which is that like the, your first step of network automation is to, is to make it so that no one logs into network devices and, and all changes are done through Git. I'm like that's step one? <laughs> like, no, that's horrible. You'll never get that done. You'll never get it approved. First off, no one, I, no network manager I've ever worked for would be on board with that as a first step. Um, so never mind the political aspect of this, but honestly, that's not only unrealistic as a first step, but it's also not valuable. Like, what do you say? What are you doing? You gotta, you gotta think of the value of what you're doing. Um, and I, and I don't think the value proposition is quite there for that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, the, the kind of things I would automate if I was, you know, if I, let's say I left uh, and, and I started working someplace else on, on a real production network again. The things that I would automate are anything that's very time consuming. And I, I don't mean that like, in, in, you know, in order to go faster or to, or to um, you know, to get more work done in less time. It's It's the same amount of work, but um, we're spending less time doing it and spending more time, you know, preparing and planning and thinking. Um, but some of those things would be like, you know, um, here's, here's, a, here's a simple thing. Um, let's say you have multiple vendors in your network and you want it, excuse me, and you have VRRP configured in different places in your network. And you want to automatically build some kind of model of what the state of your RP is in your network. Um, you'd have to log into uh, multiple devices, you know, to see what the state is um, and, and to ver validate that each device, you know, has the right view of the world. Um, so you, ha you have to know where those devices are in the first place. And then you have to, with that information you've now taken from multiple devices, you have to assemble that into an easily consumed model that tells you, you know, VERP is, you know, for, there's three devices running verp here and um this is you know the primary the secondary whatever and um you know it's been stable for x number of hours or, or something like that um y you know if you have a bunch of different verp domains because people do have they run verp you know on let's say on, on trunks or on vlans right um you could have hundreds of verp domains and um, it'd be cool if you could make a report you know what is what is the state of verb? Um, you you could log in and look at all those stats for every VLAN yourself, or you could write sort of the logic you use to understand what's going on with it, and then and then write a script that goes and collects information and produces a report. Um, yeah. Maybe filtering stuff out that's you know that's been that's working as expected for and stable for so many hours, so that you only get the things that are that are unstable. Yeah. Um, you know that 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 would, that's a time-consuming task, and that would be the perfect kind of workflow. You're collecting and correlating information um, from multiple sources, and you're you know you're putting that information together so you have a clear picture of what the state of something is in the network. Um, I was uh, I was not under the impression that we were pronouncing acronyms. Uh, could you could you uh, go? Could you tell that story again, but with the MPLS flare? MPLS flare. Was I pronouncing the acronym? VRP? I was VERP. It's yeah. VERP. Yeah. So how would you pronounce? Actually, MPLS? I was just in Toronto um, this past <laughs> week, by the way, and he's not going to say it. I'm not what Mipples? Is that what you want me to say? <laughs> MPLS with an M? Yeah, no, I'm. I don't. I've uh... never said that. Um, 
maples. Oh. I don't know. Maples maybe could work. But I have always said verf and not VRF, and that drives people insane. And I think I, I have to. I think I have to. I asked that question at in Toronto, like, what do what do you what do you people say, verf or VRF? And almost everyone said VRF. And I said, all of you are human trash. It's verf. You just say verf. <laughs> But um, and honestly, I, 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 of, of the Canadian folks I know, it's like a, 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 I think the Canadian accent for <laughs> American ears, anyway, is very like proper. They pronounce their T's very intentionally. Um, like, uh, like I would say about. You know how you kind of like don't really pronounce the T at the end. Mm-hmm. Not forgetting that they say like a boot, but I'm talking about the T portion <laughs> where they're like where they're like about, and they like very intentionally say the T at the end. Whereas we would just sort of say like about, you just uh, don't say it. Yeah, uh, there actually Wisconsin's accent is very similar to Canadian accent, especially as you go north of where I'm at. Yeah. So um, I'm kind of used to it. And I, I don't know. I don't. Plus, I grew up on the Canadian border, so I'm. I um. I guess I am used to it. I don't. Um. I don't really notice. I love Canada, though, dude. I love going to Toronto. Anyways, unless unless they put nacho cheese on steak, right? What? Right? Crab salad. It was. I thought it would just be like hunks of crab meat on the steak, which is fine. That's fine, right? Like, and then, but it wasn't. It was like he a crab a salad. This, by the way, go to his Twitter account. And you can see a picture of monstrosity. Oh, it's so gross. Yeah, go to my Twitter and you can see it's disgusting. It was like crab salad, and it was like nacho cheese on it or Velveeta. I don't know what it was. It was. It I couldn't eat it. AF. I got about halfway through and I gave up. Anyways. So that verb thing is like it's so that's one kind of workflow. It's very time consuming. You have to collect a lot of information for a lot of different like things, and then you have to you know you have to uh, put that information together just to make sure that things are working as expected, right? Yeah. Then there's um, so that's time consuming, and then there's what I what I would call error prone, um, but not necessarily high risk workflows. Meaning it's you might like put a VLAN on the put the wrong VLAN on a port or, you know, that doesn't already have a VLAN configured on it. <laughs> um, uh, you know, um, descriptions, like you put, you, you have a typo in a description. Um, you know, there's, there's like things like that um, uh, where it can, or you're doing many of the same changes, like you're adding, you know, this VLAN to a thousand ports or not a thousand, but let's say, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I've done that before. I've added a VLAN to a thousand ports. I guess it's possible, right? Or or different VLANs across those ports. And then, you know, um, when you do something like that over iteratively, over and over, um, it's easy to, to make mistakes. Um, <clears throat> above and beyond whatever mistakes are in your source of truth. So if you have a CSV file or a spreadsheet yeah. that was populated by human hands and you're reading that in, that could be full of mistakes. When I when I worked at eBay, a lot of a lot of the changes that we would make, we had to source from Salesforce because that's where a lot of the um, the data around like uh, you know network contracts and things like that was was sourced. Sure. Um, pretty sure they moved away from that after uh, even right before I left. So I don't know if that's true anymore. But a lot of the a lot of folks do that where their their contract information is in Salesforce. And so like when they sign up for service providers around the world, that's kind of where the source of truth is, where like here's here's who to contact and like here's the contact email address and, and all kinds of things like that. And um, and yeah, and that data, you, you'd be surprised how e- e- easy, well, you wouldn't, but a lot of people might be surprised just how easily that data would, would get very invalid very quickly. Um, so you really got to stay on top. Just data management itself is is tough. I, I do want to backtrack though uh, the, to the first use case that you talked about with the whole VRP um, mapping. Um, we talked a lot about the task itself and like what might be useful and how you do that. But but you also have to take a step back and think about why you would want to do that. Like why would you want to um, get a uh, get a sort of bird's eye view of the state of even just one protocol, like VRP in this case, but you probably want more in this use case where you're not just doing it for fun. Most of the time when you're trying to do things like that, where you're like trying to get like a, a snapshot of like the current state of things, a lot of times you're doing that because there's an outage and like you just want to like gather as much information as quickly as possible. And so it behooves you to like put the put the mechanisms in place to go gather that information and summarize it in a report before the outage so that when the outage happens, 
you're you're not logging into every device individually and like saying okay you know here's uh, show this show that show that and and you can just simply you know run your script and get get a bird's eye view of everything and then start with the specific troubleshooting steps as opposed to spending like the first hour just doing discovery. Like that's not fun. That's one of the things, uh, just to plug a little bit, uh, I wrote a blog on the on the whole test driven uh, network automation thing. One of the benefits of writing tests for your network is is exactly that. Like you can state in, a, in an executable format what should be. Uh, and part of that, part of that is gathering what is. So like if you use JSnappy for instance, uh, but there are other tools you can use. Um, for writing tests for your network. Part of what they do is they gather information that is required for those tests and then they make assertions. Like I expect that a certain number of BGP peers are live on this device. And if, if it's not, then I, I know there's a problem. But a simpler example would be like, like VRP is actually a really good example. In fact, I'm thinking about, I, I, I think I might need to write some additional tests for that in the lesson that we have, because unlike BGP, uh, a lot of people, when they when they look at VRP neighborships, if, if there's a if there's a if there's a difference there, you kind of have to go looking for it because VRP like it, like redundant uh, layer three interfaces kind of work until they really don't. You know what I mean? Like you could have so many like soft failures all over the place, but you'd never know about it. Um, a good example is like any HA system. Really, this isn't even just networking. Um, until you test failover. Like you don't know for sure if it's actually working, and this is a really good way of knowing like how many unknowns are out there. Like if you if your VRRP situation isn't what you expect, that's that's a problem because then you don't have redundancy at all. You have single points of failure. Anyway, building tests ahead of time is a great way to sort of like prevent you from being in that situation where you're like under duress and you're thinking about like losing your job if you don't fix the the outage in the next like half hour or so. Um, because you don't have to worry about that because you've done the hard work of gathering the data uh, or automating the gathering of data ahead of time. And so all you got to do in the, in the moment when you are under duress is effectively hit a button, get a report, and then focus on the specific task at hand. That's very valuable. It is. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm gonna, we'll, we'll harp a little bit more on that first example. Um, there's another reason why you, you kind of Building automation for that purpose, like collecting and correlating information, is useful for the purposes of complete, uh, like completeness. Um, so it could be, it could be. I've made this kind of mistake when I was a younger network engineer, and I've seen this mistake happen so many times. People think, you know, they have a basic idea of how something like VRP works, right? VRP works. And um, and so they decide, you know, I'm just going to log into the master. And if the master says it's been master and stable, then um, then it's probably good, right? I, I move <clears> on. I don't have to. Why would I have to check anything else? It's been stable, right? And they, what they don't grasp is that it's possible for two things to think that they're master at the same time, um, yeah. and or to actually for some reason end up not having the same timers, right? Like one will say, hey, I've been master for 24 hours, but the another one would say, well, I've only seen him as a master for 12 hours, right? Um, yeah. and, and unless you're collecting all of that information, you know, completely, and then specifically looking for those discrepancies, um, it can be very easy to make the wrong assumptions or to, to look over those things and, and to miss something. And, yeah. um, and so writing automation for the, for the, can, can help you be more thorough and, and more accurate when you're, when you're doing those, when you're trying to figure out what's going on in your, in your network. And it's also way easier to do both technically and politically because you're not changing anything. Like you can keep doing the actual configuration changes manually for years but if you write tests for what it should be you're helping first off you're helping guide folks that do make changes to understand what should be instead of just having like a golden config which doesn't really tell you much that it doesn't inc you know include any operational state so having tests in a in a format that does both config and operational state means that you have like a standard for what should be and you've committed it into a place that's not in your head like that's that's so valuable. But like I said, no one you don't need to ask anyone's permission to do that. You're not changing anything on your network, so it's just a read-only operation. So like that, there's no risk there. Um, it it automatically immediately provides value to you because you're effectively uh, sharing through an executable means 
what should be with the rest of your team. And so now everybody's on board with like, oh yeah, VRP should be configured this way. And we, we should be running this on all of our devices uh, the same way. Um, and, and you haven't made any configuration changes yet. Like you've already reaped all of this value out of automation, but you haven't changed anything. And, and so when we talk about automation not being limited to configuration management, this is the kind of stuff we're talking about. Because um, in many ways, it's more valuable than doing the, auto, doing the config change in an automated fashion. You know, ITIL has forced us to make changes over the weekend anyway. So if we automate <laughs> that, what are we, what are we doing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think, I think in the long run, what we'll see is, you know, these tool sets develop where that allow, that help people automatically pull information and correlate them correlate yeah. the, the information into something that's usefully consumable and it's both sorry useful and consumable and um and i think if we do nre labs right in the long run that's the workflows that we have in and there should by a majority over time they should be um mostly about correlation uh, picking yeah. um finding information and, and, and correlating it and i honestly i I, this is probably a little bit of me being unhappy with everything, like it, it, everything that I do, I'm unhappy. Um, but uh, the the categories on NRE Labs, just understand that that's meant to be fluid. Like we're not, you know, that's going to change. Um, as Especially as we get more workflows in there, the nature of the workflows are going to be very different between each other. We're going to have, we're just going to have to have different ways of coming up with like categorization of these things. Um, so just FYI, <laughs> so We're already seeing that, like even the three or four workflows that are there are like wildly different from each other. So, um, you know, we, we should automate things that are, that are risky. Um, you know, we didn't, we didn't give an example of that yet. We should automate things that are error prone. Um, and we should automate things that are time consuming. And, um, those, those are really the three things that we should be, those are the three kinds of workflows that you should do. So we gave the VRP example that can be very time consuming. Um, then you've error prone. That VRP example can also be error prone. If you're doing all that by hand, if you have thousands of VLANs all running VRP and you're manually collecting the VRP state across all those VLANs, um, yeah. then you're making a mistake, right? You're, you're, it's easy to make a mistake in that process to miss a VLAN, to misread the numbers, to, to you know that you're seeing in the state, etc. Um, and then. You know, the, the last thing um, is are things that are risky, right? The error prone doesn't necessarily mean risky, um, but risky means, you know, I'm going to make this change. It should be simple, right? Anyone should be able to make this change. But if it goes wrong, it, like there's going to, it's not, it's going to be an unfun day, right? So, um, like Target going offline for four hours. Ex exactly. Like Target going offline for four hours. I have no idea what caused that, but I'm assuming it's the network. So, so, uh, you know, that's, th those are like the three sorts of things. That, and, and those are all things that you do as a network engineer. What you're, what we're not highlighting on NRE Labs is like automating the network itself, like having the network behave, uh, other than all the ways that it's already dynamic, adding more dynamic behavior on top of that. Because that's, you know, that's the kind of thing that, um, that's that's almost product development and requires serious effort and time and and uh, and design to do correctly. Um, and 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 in my mind, um, you know, th there are tools out there that do that kind of thing. And those are the tools that I was sort of trying to differentiate in my mind when someone asks, you know, how come I can't just buy this automation in a box and put it on? Why do I have to know what API is? Well, you're really talking about two different things. Um, you know, there are tools that can add additional sort of dynamic behavior on top of the network. And, you know, those, those are like, those are products, right? They have a UI and on the, and, and then you, you interact with the UI and on, on the back end, they go and they drive things um, in the network. And that kind of automation is different than what we're talking about. Um, because what we're talking about never goes away. There'll never be a tool that does literally all the things, not just for the network, but for, like I said, all those other things, systems that are external, systems that are attached to the edge of the network, systems in the management domain. Um, no tool will ever be integrated with all those things and automatically do all the things in exactly the way that's right for your organization. So those are really two different, 
two different things. Um, and and so the yeah, that, I mean, I guess that was that was the thrust of uh, what I was wanted to get through on this conversation is that yeah. you know what we're talking about is this is this other thing that you're automating things that you do as an engineer, not necessarily automating the network. Just ask yourself, how can automation help me in everything that I do in a given week? That's that's what you have to start with. The answer is going to be different for everybody, but if you're starting off on that premise, I think you're in a lot better shape than how can I automate the network today? You're kind of constraining yourself if you think about it that way. Yeah. And, you know, there's, there's something else, too, I want to point out. We, we sort of hit on this. We said we spend so little time actually configuring. It's kind of crazy that there's so much effort goes into automating configuration. <laughs> Um, yeah. For because it because in the end, even if something perfect came out, it's going to save you an hour a week of time, um, yeah. and it, I, it that's not a compelling argument for me. So, um, yeah. you know, one of the things that comes up and I tell people all the time is, uh, so so you have a workflow that you want to automate. Um, you know, that workflow can be broken down into effectively a pre-check some activity in a post check, right? And that activity may or may not be a configuration change. In fact, in like we were saying, in most cases, it probably isn't a configuration change. Um, and the, you know, the, those are three possible stages and the, you know, the pre-check might not exist, but um, if you're going to write automation to do anything, you should be writing the automation that does the pre-check and the post check. Um, mm -hmm. The automation that gathers information from disparate sources and pulls it together and correlates it to make uh, an understandable model um, re relevant to the thing that you're, the activity you're about to engage in and then do the same thing after the fact after you've engaged in that activity so you'd be automating um, all of you what you're really automating is um, I guess I don't know it's like information information processing around you know that, that comes with network data um, and the systems that surround the network yeah. Um, and then the actual activity you do could be manual, but the the first things that you should automate are the things, you know, are, is all the checking and the correlation that happens before and after those activities. Um, that because that's what automation should be about: doing things more reliably, not and, and being more informed when you do those things, um, versus just yeah. automating some change, which, in retrospect, might end up being a very bad mistake. You know, now you've automated that mm -hmm. change across a hundred devices instead of just one. Well, like, how do you even like? Uh, I think I think people, uh, you you like you gotta you gotta consider that it's not care about. It. It's knowing if the change worked. Like, how can you possibly know uh, that you're that you've automated a configuration change successfully unless you know that you're continuing to do the things that you need to do, and unless you know that your network is continuing to offer the services that it's been that has been relied upon, right? Like if you tried to carry the way that we currently do that forward into a into an automated configuration management paradigm, uh, you're gonna have a bad time. Like I I, I know I, I know myself. Like I, whenever I made changes and all manual, like when I was a consultant, we would spend like all night ripping out a core network uh, core switch you know a core switch pair uh, or two in a hospital, for instance. Um, and and our and like it would be over the weekend. Not that hospitals are. <laughs> really off on the weekends but it was just like a lower time so like middle of the night weekends like generally speaking pretty low low impact uh, time relatively speaking and we would rip the whole network out and re you know re, uh, re, re uh, you know put in some new switches or whatever uh, whatever we did and then uh and then we would we would have it all configured the way that we know it needs to be configured and we would start doing ping test <laughs> like, <laughs> like if you try to do that just understand that you don't like that's not going to really cut it uh, if you're trying to do things in like either a larger scale or if you're trying to really truly ensure that that your network is doing the same thing that it it needs to be doing. And the reason I say that is because we weren't actually doing that then. Pinging stuff back then wasn't sufficient either. It's not like the times have changed. Like we were just flailing about at what we thought was useful. But inevitably, when Monday rolled around and all the doctors came back into work, um, you know, in full, like. There would always be problems, and we knew that. So I think it's just time that we acknowledge that and stop trying to fix the thing that's not the actual constraint. Like the speed at which changes are happening is not a constraint. You might think it is, but it's not. It's 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 uh, 
it's it's just not the real constraint is how we ensure the network is providing services which is almost always a read-only operation so start with that yeah so actually um somebody we have uh, well first uh, hello to overjects who um he is um, I, I should be checking chat here more often um he says that he likes our personal stories and like to hear an explanation someday and how we came up with our um twitter handles um and but then we have fun ball i can't i think it says ball b-h-a-l-k-k uh that's an i b-h-a-i oh fun by yeah. kk it says uh where do these videos go they go on youtube um both the live stream that we do every monday and the tuesday community stand-up meetings um they're all recorded and the videos are posted on on our youtube channel which is it's nre labs um on on youtube um and you can watch uh every one of these streams that we've done up until this point um and and every one of our community stand-ups so which i i some of them it's it's worth watching so uh please you know, subscribe to that YouTube channel and you'll be notified when new videos get posted. And there'll be additional content um, happening um, within, before the end of the year, not just this and the, and the community stand-up. Okay, he's got another question. In intent-based networking, how do you deal with deletion of intent resulting in deletion of configuration? Is it a good idea to delete the configuration completely and then add the new configuration? Deletion, resulting in the deletion of configuration on the device. Um, so, I we don't really do intent-based networking in NRE Labs. It's more like a product thing, like where you you know you have a user. It's like a product. It's like encapsulated automation where you're interfacing, you know, through some GUI or some, you know a CLI could even be, and um, yeah. you you declare you know you have some declarative way of saying how you want the network to work and then um and then that tool goes it, re, it parses that and then goes and it pushes configs or whatever it's going to do down to um to some portion of the infrastructure that it drives and if you delete that intent um what happens if you delete that policy this will declare a policy um and it is that it could result in stuff being deleted um in the network right i so I don't, we don't really, I guess we don't really address intent-based stuff because it's, that's more of a product thing, but yeah, I guess we're going to answer. Are, there are, I mean, there are ways you can conceptually think about that. I mean, if you think about, uh, so Damien, uh, Damien over at uh, Roblox, he actually gave this talk at, at Interop and he talked actually on packet pushers when he was on packet pushers as well. Um, they, uh, they don't, they're not, they didn't talk about any like intent-based product, but what they, what they do is when they. Um, rent, when they create configurations for their network devices, they do so from a source of truth outside the outside of the network itself, and then they they effectively what they do is they overwrite the entire config so that there's no portion of the config that could possibly be outdated because it's generated in full somewhere else and then applied in full on the device. So there's no chance of anything aging out. Um, I've never, yeah, I, I, um, I, I, I mean, Derek, you might know this better than I do, but I, I would imagine that the easiest way to do that in an intent-based networking like product is, is the same kind of thing, where instead of like trying to figure out, oh, did this policy change this portion of the config versus this portion, rather than doing that, it just simply overwrites the entire config. That way, everything's yeah, consistent. I think that's that's what, how I would do it. That's what all of them do right now. Yeah, to be honest, it's, it's just too challenging to even try to like figure out what's true on the, like what, what, you know, first go get the config and like parse through it and like the operational state and see how things are. And then, and then like come up with some sort of a, a diff that, that gets to where you need to go. Like, it's just too messy. Start with the source of truth, generate the full config and overwrite it, which uh, you can either do with an intent based networking product that does it that way, or you can do it yourself. Like, you know, the folks over at Roblox have done. Um, uh, I'll see if I can find a link to that that pack of pushers show because that was a good show. He talks about that. Not everybody can do that. Um, they they have a few things in place that allow that allow them to do that safely, uh, but it seems to be working for them. <laughs> There's also um, a lot of reused configuration inside of a device, and it's like the classic example is you know a VLAN or whatever is is created on a device and multiple ports use this vlan so if you want to you know remove 
the VLAN from a port, at which point is it safe to remove the VLAN itself from the config so that it doesn't exist anymore at all on the device? Um, there's like lots of sort of hierarchical information that can that can exist that way, right? Um, uh, you have policies that reference ask, access lists and and so on. So you you know that's one of the challenges, I guess, um, if you're going to build your own intent-based system, is you have to understand what those dependencies are, um, so that you don't blow away a configuration that you didn't intend to, um, so to speak. Yeah, that would be that's an interesting. It says uh, that makes a lot of sense, but it's hard to do on Cisco, for example. SPF config could be a lot, but deletion only takes no router OSPF. But then configuration itself can never have a no version of config line. So uh, you're not hijacking the show. It's fine. You know what? We could do a whole show. Like if you wanted to. I mean that. I mean a lot of people do build. I, I want to say like intent based solutions they they leverage the concept of intent in the tooling that they have or, or build and that and there's got to be considerations around that I, I it would be fun to sit and have a conversation with someone who's done this um, that that isn't selling a product right that is that's tried to build their own intent based or or at least borrow from an intent based we should have Damien on we should just have Damien on because he's he, they've built it that's a, that's literally what they've done is they've built an intent based system but it's not built into a product. They just kind of made it part of their operations. That'd okay. Be good. He'd be a good guest. He'd love to. I'm, I'm sure he'd love to come on. We should ask him. Oh no! My fidgeting Lego man lost an arm. I gotta go find that. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Let's do that. Let's re. Uh, you want to? We both should reach out to him and then try to. Uh... We should both reach out to him individually. Yes, in the most annoying Question. way possible. Hey, did you notice? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can I, uh, I think this was a good discussion. Um, I, I, I th before we end, I would like to just mention one quick thing. Do you think we've we've kicked this one? Um, well, let's summarize real quick, right? So the idea behind the categories that we have is that you know you, you should be automating workflows that you actually do as a network engineer and not worried about adding more dynamic behavior to your network um, yeah. and and the actual things you should automate um, they should be things that are kind of risky or time consuming or error prone and then and then even with those tasks the first thing you should automate is that is, is either pre-task validation or post-task validation um, those, those that should be like the priority of how you know uh, the kind of automation we're talking about that's that should be how you do it right that's that that should be the goal um and, and it it's and, and it's always with this reliability thing in mind like how do i do things more effectively more reliably how do i you know uh, you know that's um that that's what the goal should be, not just going faster, right? And and not just config changes. Like, I I I think in the end we will end up with many work, more workflows about collecting and correlating information than than config stuff. And that was the point here is that that's how we differentiate ourselves from like products that talk that have you know that are sold as they, they do automation, but it's encapsulated and and you don't really touch it. You don't have to know how any of that works versus what what we're talking about, which is you know, um, you know how how do I not just interact with the network, but the systems around the network, the systems in the management domain, and you know uh, how do I how do I automate you know what I do every day you know with with those with those areas of my infrastructure. So that, that's yeah. that's the summary. So yes, now it's beat. All right, let's consider it dead. Uh, solved, in fact. So we never have to talk about it again, right? It's going to, every single time it's going to come up. <laughs> yeah. no. So what are we going to talk about on stand-up tomorrow? Because we should Basically, plug that. Yeah. So here, I'll just summarize it with words because I, I, there's no way I'm going to be able to get into, into enough detail right now anyway. It's at the end of the stream. Basically, one of the things that came up last week on last week's stand-up was the need for more documentation. And I, I've i tried to spend a lot of time on docs, but it's kind of hard to like really, really build it out because you know you have to keep this balance of like moving the platform forward while also moving the docs forward. We're at the point now where I'm like kind of desperate for help with the platform. And so I, I'm just forced effectively to like 
really, really, really invest in all of the things around the right, you know, everything around everything around and not including right platform to help other folks get on board with how it works. One of the one of those things is documentation, it, it, like a lot of documentation. So um, I built documentation for like the new the new endpoint abstraction, which does the whole like configurations and presentations things, which we talked about on a previous stream. Yeah, that's documented and it's in a it's in a PR that I'm going to be merging hopefully today. Um, I also built a new page for like if you don't know anything about Git, like you can go to this page and it explains everything you need to contribute to uh, an NRE Labs or an Antidote um, uh, Git repository, or not even contribute to like anything that you might possibly want to do with a repository. Um, it's not really meant to be a Git 101. Uh, there are there are links to other tutorials for like really really fundamental Git stuff. But if you if you want to like figure out how we have things organized and like what it looks like to like fork something and, and things like that. There's a whole page just for that, like just for Git stuff. Um, and then there's a totally new documentation on the on contributing to the Antidote platform. We already have kind of architecture docs, which I'm going to be updating later. But one thing we didn't have was like, okay, I want to start contributing to the Antidote platform. How do I even start doing that? So I have a doc on that. Um, there's, so there's just, a, and then, oh yeah, I forgot there's also on how to contribute to the docs. Um, I built a whole page focused on like, okay, cool. Like a lot of, we, a lot of projects, including ours, one of the things that we tell people is, um, uh, you know, if you want to get started with this project, one of the easiest ways to get started is to, is to start contributing to the docs, like read the docs, find typos and find things that don't make sense, you know, ask questions, figure out what, what the answer is, and then, you know, contribute that back to the docs. Um, but we don't let people know how to do that. So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to let people know how to do that. So I built a page focused on how to contribute to the docs. So all kinds of new documentation changes, hopefully going to be dropping tomorrow. Um, we won't obviously be done. There's still lots more to do, but it's going to be a nice big addition uh, that I think is long overdue. So stay tuned for that. We'll be talking about it and hopefully showing it uh, tomorrow. Yeah, so every single Tuesday at uh, 8 a.m. Pacific, um, we have it. It's it's at that time because it's, you know, it's um, it that makes the meeting doable for people who are in Europe. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the time we chose to try to get as much people, as many people as we can on those stand-up calls. Um, it's 8 a.m. Pacific. Um, the details for which are located um, on our community forum site, uh, community.networkreliability.engineering. It should be the banner, the banner post that's on the top of every page. Um, there's a link you can click uh, tomorrow, and uh, please join. Even if you don't have anything to say, um, you you'll be present and counted, and and um, you know you'll you'll see how the kind con the conversation goes, and then maybe next time, you know you'll you'll have you'll be more confident, you know, uh, speaking up and and um, uh, you know. Um, expressing your ideas so please please come to the uh, to the uh, community stand up and uh, tomorrow at 8 a.m. and we, we hope to see you there um, also you know every single week Monday at 10 a.m. Pacific is when we do this stream so you know mark your calendars um, and all the usual things you know sign up for our discord chat server um, sign up you know for our community forum site um, follow us on Twitter, follow us on YouTube, follow us on Twitch. Um, we should probably write a script that does all of that, but <laughs> that would, I feel like that would be more laborious. That would than, be too professional. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, stay on, stay on top of everything that we're doing. So the, this video will be posted on YouTube, um, you know, shortly. Cool. That's it, I guess. I'm I'm Derek Winkworth, Cloud Toad. This is my co-host Matt Mirdin, M-I-E-R-D-I-N, and uh, see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow.